Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's great to see so many people here. I know that we are all a bit zoomed out, but it's fantastic that we can have this conversation together. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Petra Molnar, and I'm your moderator today. And it really is my pleasure to uh, engage in this conversation that is of crucial importance. Because for the first time in its 15-year history, the European Union's coastal and border agency, Frontex, has been the subject of a wave of critical press coverage. Frontex is now under investigation from the European Parliament to the anti-fraud agency, and its leadership faces calls to resign over a rap sheet stretching from violating human rights and international law to fraud and harassment of its own staff. However, the power of Frontex still seems to be unabated. It is bolstered by a huge influx of funding, an expanded mandate, and shiny new surveillance technologies that help do its work all the while taking extraordinary steps to reduce scrutiny of its operations and int intimidate transparency activists. In this ecosystem, how should reporters cover Frontex? Today's event, hosted by Lighthouse Reports, uh, an investigative unit that pioneers collaborative journalism, the Refugee Law Lab, and the Migration Technology Monitor, uh, will take you behind the scenes of a series of investigations that have culminated in unprecedented calls for accountability. Our panel draws from the leading media that have worked with us, and they will discuss how we broke open an institution that rejected scrutiny and claimed it could police itself. Before we get into it, though, um, just a few housekeeping. Um, for our audience, please keep your cameras and microphones off um, during the presentations, because some panelists will be sharing screens. And type your questions into the chat. Uh, I will do my best to collect them and direct them to the panelists during the Q&A. We will also be posting resources and reports into the chat, so keep an eye out for that. And also do keep up with our work on social media. And you can also ask questions on Twitter if you want, um, but for the, the sake of uh, my moderating, perhaps in the chat would be best. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists in the order that they will appear. They will each speak for about seven minutes and then we will open it up to a broader discussion with all of you. So our first panelist is Daniel Howden. Daniel is the Managing Director of Lighthouse Reports, an investigative unit that pioneers collaborative journalism. Daniel will discuss the behind the scenes challenges in investigating Frontex and the importance of why collaborative journalism is well suited to tackling these kinds of stories. Next up, we will have Nick Waters, who is a senior investigator for Bellingcat. His work has focused on the application of open source techniques to the investigation of conflict and the application of these techniques to track uh, conflicts worldwide to improve international accountability. Nick will be talking about the June 8th pushback incident off the northeast coast of Lesbos and the resulting investigation. Nick will be followed up by Stefan Lutke, who is a reporter and staff writer for Der Spiegel magazine. Stefan uh, covers migration in Spanish politics and society and he will cover various facets of Frontex investigations, including working with NGOs and survivors to draw a more complete picture of the agency and the problems that we have that have followed. And last, we have Katie Fallon, who is a journalist um, working with The Guardian, who has in recent years been focusing on migration in Europe and Greece, and more specifically Lesbos. Katie will give us a bit of an on the ground perspective, situating Frontex and the resulting investigations within the island context. Please, I will now turn it over to Daniel for his intervention. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much to Petra and thanks to um, everybody that's joining. Um, and welcome to the first event that Lighthouse is doing. Um, our thanks to the Refugee Law Lab um, and our unending praise to the Migration Tech Monitor um, for, for their work. Um, I'd like to start um, so for, forgive the slight award ceremony spiel. Um, I do think it's just important to say that there are people on, everyone on this panel has done important work in the direction of um, shining a spotlight on Frontex, but it's a panel. It does, it's not exhaustive. And there are a whole host of people who have been working on this and without whom um, Frontex accountability work would not, would not be happening. Um, so just a very, very quick um, run through of, uh, from, from State Watch to um, Mariana Gliati, um, Apostolis Fotiadis, who's worked with us on this, Lena Caravanivo, um, Luisa and Arne, who's battled with Frontex, um, uh, looked more expensive for them than anybody else 
um, just to say that if you're on this call, um, you're you're very much acknowledged as as people who've contributed to this, as are people at Glan um, who have uh, taken important um, strategic litigation steps on this issue. So just to put that out front and center. Um, I'm going to start off by taking us back a couple of years. Um, we met with some of those people um, in Amsterdam and we were a group of journalists and we were looking at and thinking about um, how it was that a large, a kind of unprecedented agency had grown up um, inside the European Union um, without really ever becoming a story. Um, we were looking at budget forecasts for Frontex at that point. Um, which projected that it would become the best funded agency in the European Union. Um, we, talked to, uh, we talked to people who understood the institution about whether or not um, its, uh, its own internal policing method, um, infrastructure was up to the job, and they said, no, it's not. Well, what about their procurement? Is, um, is the way that they set about doing tenders and contracts, is, is that... Um, is that up to standard? And the answer was no. Um, well, what are they doing operationally? Well, it's really hard to know because they, they restrict the amount of information that's available. They won't answer simple questions about um, what resources they deploy and where they go. Um, well, what's it like to try and talk to them and to get some answers to these questions? Well, broadly speaking, impossible. Um, getting answers to, to questions out of Frontex has always felt like an incredibly unwilling joust. Um, and there's always a tension between institutions and the press corps that cover them. Um, but this was exceptionally the case um, uh, with Frontex. Um, the problem we were told was that editors and the public didn't know anything about them and couldn't care less. Um, so. What, we, what was called for, in our opinion, was a series of sustained investigations um, where we could actually break some new ground um, and, and try, to, try to identify potentially specific cases of wrongdoing or areas where we should be really concerned um, and to, to build up an audience for these stories and to cultivate interest among, among editors. Now, the first round of, of these stories came out um, in the summer of, uh, of 2019. Um, we ran a story in, in The Guardian, which, um, which revealed the fact that Frontex was expanding its capacity um, for, um, for drones over the central Mediterranean. Um, and we got a taste of how Frontex responded to stories that it didn't like. Um, furious letters followed within um, 24 hours. Uh, various threats of, um, of legal action um, came forth. Uh, Frontex took to Twitter to denounce the story and um, partner stories in, in the German media. Um, and not a single point of what they tried to have retracted actually um, turned out to be accurate. Um, so they had to walk back from, uh, from all of that, but we had a taste of how aggressively it pushed back against stories um, which potentially um, brought Frontex to, to light in a negative way. Go forward a year um, and we had, um, we had the first stories which were beginning to establish beyond reasonable doubt that there were um, pushbacks at land and sea um, on the Greek borders at Evros and in the Aegean, where asylum seekers um, were being were being forcibly returned um, to to Turkey, um, and at the same time we had a huge deployment of of, um, of Frontex assets, um, and the question became again, you know, what is Frontex doing here? Um, what role is it playing in this? Um, I think it's for. There's a many people on this call who are undoubtedly um, expert on this and for whom this is not new. But just to, to explain that Frontex presents itself in its own language and its own documentation as a technocratic organization to manage migration flows um, in a general political environment in which there's tremendous anxiety over migration, anxiety amongst governments who have watched um, their ideological fellow travelers um, lose, kicked out of office 
because of um, popular opinion swings that happen over migration. Um, Frontex was, was an ideal answer. It's an agency that's going to be able to bring this whole migration situation under control. It's going to do so with respect for fundamental rights. It's going to do so within European and international law frameworks. Um, and it, it's a very sanitized presentation. Um, in reality, this, this, this kind of, this approach has seen, has seen them attract enormous flows of, um, of funds. Um, with very little examination of whether or not they were able to do this in this sanitized way. Um, so when we put this under proper examination, and Nick is going to talk um, a, a bit about how open source methods played into this, um, but it really, it was clear to us that in the Aegean, there were obvious violations of international law happening. Frontex was present in very, uh, in with a very substantial number of assets. They had surveillance equipment that was there that was highly sophisticated. So it was it was high, it was very hard to to believe that they couldn't be at the very least um, knowledgeable about what was going on. Um, and, the, and therefore the next question was going to be are they reporting what's going on? What are, how are they responding? To this situation that we're observing and that's why we launched into an investigation with um, ARD, with TDSI, with, with Spiegel um, and with Ballincat um, and others who helped along the way to try and examine that. Um, obviously we wouldn't be here having this conversation if we hadn't been able to find something. I'll leave it to Nick to explain in a bit more detail what was found. Um, what I would say is that isolated cases Related to Frontex have been appearing in stories for a long time. It was it was this approach of putting together a transnational team across a whole bunch of different languages and speaking to major audiences in different European countries. It, the results of, of these reports had impact precisely because of the reach that this investigation was able to put together. So um, I'm going to let others talk more detail about um, about that but just to kind of to set the scene where we were when we came into this um, what were some of the early decisions um, and a little bit of respect paid to other people whose hard work um, set the ground for, for us to be able to do this in the first place um, so back to you Petra Thank you so much, Daniel, for setting the stage for us. Um, I mean, it's really important to understand the broader ecosystem in which Frontex operates, particularly around the border industrial complex and how this is all playing out. I'm really curious to now hear from Nick, who's going to tell us about his work at Bellingcat. Go ahead, Nick. Cool, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen um, for my presentation. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through how we identified one of the incidents uh, of interest and then dug down into it um, and blended both traditional uh, reporting techniques with the kind of open source uh, aspect as well and how that produced actually some incredibly powerful work. Um, so when we started this project, one of the first things that we tried to do is try and work out where uh, Frontex had all its assets and what assets it actually had in the Aegean. And so the first and most obvious place to look is for me, the, the open sources. You know, if you have uh, your uh, boats deployed in like a tourist hotspot uh, off the north coast of Lesbos, you're gonna have tourists walking around taking pictures of it because, you know, it looks kind of cool. Um, and so really a case of going around and trying to find as many of these uh, images as possible to try and work out what vessels uh, were there, what helicopters there, what um, planes were flying overhead. And once we had uh, some of these vessels uh, and indeed some of the planes as well, we could actually um, get the data of where they'd been. Uh, so a lot of ships, or all ships, large ships, have um, AAS trackers, which basically send or ping the location of that boat every, every few seconds. And by that manner, you can track vessels as they move through the sea. Uh, what we did is with our list of all the different vessels that Frontex had was uh, look for the data um, using sites like uh, marine traffic and uh, uh, other ones. Um, and the although a lot of those vessels had their AS responders turned off, and so you couldn't find them, 
uh, some did have their AS transponders turned on. And that meant that we could actually get an overview of some of the vessels, uh, or where some of the vessels uh, that Frontex were using uh, were deployed, where they were going. Now, that, that was interesting enough in itself. Um, but because we also had a, a list uh, of alleged pushback incidents, um, what we could actually do is um, overlay the data of these vessels' movements uh, with the data we had of the actual pushbacks. And what we get is something like this. So here you can see a pushback that was listed on the 8th of June. And what we can see is actually not a Frontex vessel, but a NATO warship up here. And then a Frontex vessel, Nortada, down here. And both vessels were in the vicinity of where it had been reported there had been a, a pushback on that, on that date and time. And so for us, obviously, this then became, you know, a day of interest to us. And we started looking into, into more detail. And uh, we found that actually there had already been a pushback reported by uh, the Andalus Agency, which is a Turkish news agency. Um, but their video basically included multiple different clips uh, of uh, different incidents within the Aegean. It was actually really difficult to tell, you know, is this video actually from the 8th of June? Um, and so what we did is we uh, got in touch with the Turkish Coast Guard and got all the, uh, asked them if they had any images or videos of this particular incident. And they sent back a bunch of videos. And this was quite a lot of videos. I think this is something like uh, almost 20 videos uh, showing uh, what they claim to be this incident. Um, but in some of them, some of them are quite blurry, difficult to tell, but some of them seem to be quite clear, such as this one. And what you can see is uh, a small rubber dinghy. And in the background, you can see the MAI-1103, you can tell by the bow number, which is a Romanian uh, ship, which was uh, seconded to Frontex. And this is currently being recorded by what looks like uh, an ISR camera, so information surveillance and reconnaissance camera on a Turkish Coast Guard vessel. So again, uh, you know, we have this uh, video, seems pretty clear. There's the MAI-1103. Uh, there is a, a rolled boat there that's clearly uh, overloaded with people that is consistent with what we've seen with other pushbacks. But it's quite difficult to uh, establish the wider context from just that clip. Uh, you, you can't tell exactly where it is. You can't tell when it is. So what we would do is went through this video to try and establish that when and where these videos were filmed. And the ISR camera is quite useful because it included uh, the coordinates we believe where the reticule of that camera was pointing. And we could plug that into to Google Earth. And then we can compare uh, the landscape of Google Earth versus the landscape that you can see in one of these videos. And what I've done at the top there is stitch these, uh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, is this in the way? Um, I've stitched uh, a panoramic together from the various different screenshots of one of these videos. And as you can see, it matches pretty much perfectly uh, with the landscape that you can see from that location on Google Earth. So we've got the location. We're confident about that. Uh, if you move a couple of kilometers north or south or east or west, you get a different viewpoint. So we're confident about that. We're also confident that the video showed the same uh, incident because you could see the same people in the D in each one. Uh, at the front right-hand side of the boat, you could see the same person with a white hood and the same person with uh, a red uh, jacket as well. It's less clear on this one. Um, but by looking at that vessel, we could tell that it's the same uh, dinghy in each one of these videos. And also, we got other glimpses of information in these videos as well. So in this one in particular, what you can see here is that NATO vessel that I was talking about earlier. And then, again, this is filmed by the Turkish Coast Guard. You see the person probably on a mobile phone swings down and captures a, you know, a screen showing the radar and different vessels that are on that radar. And then swings back and it shows uh, that dinghy. And this is very useful for us because this also allows us to further con confirm that date that did actually happen on the 8th of June. 
because what you can do is you can see the uh, coast of Turkey on the top of the screen. And we can take uh, the data we had of that, of the movement of that NATO warship on the 8th of June. And as you can see, I just want you to focus on that particular area. And we can overlay that radar screen on the movements uh, or on the Turkish coast. And we can actually see that this NATO vessel was pointing north right there. And in the video, you can actually see that NATO vessel is at that location and is pointing in that orientation at the time. Just further confirmation that these videos are indeed from the 8th of June. Now, what we did is, again, this is pretty abridged. There's lots of other data, that, or there was other data there. Um, but this allowed us to get several snapshots of what were happening or what happened on the 8th of June. Um, and what we got is starting from kind of quite early in the morning, about 5.51 in the morning, uh, we could see that MAI-1103, which didn't have an AS transponder, so we didn't have any data for that. Um, but we could see them in this area, uh, appearing to be between the dinghy uh, and the islands of Lesbos, with the Turkish Coast Guard uh, in that kind of vicinity, but they were certainly pointing south. Then at about 8.45, uh, we can see the NATO vessel seems to be tracking. This pushback is taking place. The dinghy's moved to the northwest, uh, um, and we can still see uh, the Turkish Coast Guard and dinghy. Um, and at this point, there still appears to be a pushback going on. We've got video of the Turkish Coast Guard um, sending out a small vessel uh, to this boat repeatedly uh, of uh, waves being produced by these large vessels in an attempt, apparent attempt to push this uh, dinghy away from the Greek, uh, Greek territory. And ultimately finishes off uh, with that final video with the NATO uh, warship still observing and with the Turkish Coast Guard here and the dinghy here, um, and then the Frontex vessel Notada slightly down to the southeast. Um, so this is just like a small example of how we took those kind of open sources, the ship tracking data, the AS data, um, data from more traditional journalistic techniques, such as the information about where these pushbacks were reported to have taken place, the videos uh, that we received from Turkish Coast Guard, how we verified them, placed them in time and space to establish what happened on, on the 8th of June. Um, and that's something we did a few times across various different instances we looked at. But for me, it's like it's a very good case study of how you can combine those two different techniques to, to work out what happened. I apologize, I think I've gone a little bit over, um, but I, I hope you enjoyed that presentation, how uh, yeah, and how, how we actually worked out what happened on, on the 8th of June with that kind of lack of data. Um, how we ping together those, those different examples to make parts of a jigsaw puzzle. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, not to bring unnecessary levity to all of this, but perhaps we are all a little bit more familiar with these trip tracking things, given what just happened in the Suez Canal. <laughs> but levity aside, I mean, these are incredible new tools to use um, in these investigations. I'll now turn it over to Stefan. Um, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Petra. So um, I'll, I'll try to be briefer as Nick because it's not going to be so fancy since uh, what was left um, essentially for for us more traditional journalists was largely to um, complement this OSINT evidence um, that we had. So we had this list, we had some coordinates of pushbacks and we started to contact uh, NGOs and other organizations um, that were um, well, contacted by migrants that are on the move. Uh, and over those kind of organizations, uh, we started to interview survivors. So that was critical because this way we wanted to, we were able to complement the, the evidence and also show another layer of those kind of pushbacks. Um, they told us, for instance, about uh, a pushback case on August 15th. So we had only an image uh, of, of that pushback that was showing a Frontex vessel next and close to the dinghy. And we were able to um, interview the survivors and by that exemplify the, yeah, the violence and the true horror that those so-called pushbacks really mean um, because people are left adrift without knowing if they ever will be rescued. They have no food, no water. They, the dinghy is boarded by uh, 
Greek uh, Coast Guard uh, members that wear masks and destroy the motor. So by interviewing those survivors, we were man uh, we managed to get more material because nowadays everyone has a mobile phone. So all those migrants that are attempting to go to Samos or Lesbos, they do film those kind of locations. And then this was plugged back into our OSINT machine, um, which was run by Nick and others. And they were able to geolocate this kind of videos to show us what, what we would be able to what, what we would be able to verify from those kind of videos. Um, I think this was particularly important because uh, we had to uh, we had to make clear that every kind of material um, that came from the Turkish Coast Guard, we, for instance, at Spiegel inside the reporting, we would make clear this photo came from the Turkish Coast Guard. We would write this down all the time. And we knew this would be attacked, but it was not our only material. And um, those stories by survivors, by migrants came in very handy there. Um, and the videos especially came in very handy there. So this was this was what, what we uh, or what one part of what we did for the first uh, investigation that was published in October, I believe, in fall. Um, we started back back in summer working on it, and this obviously made a big splash. And I just want to briefly mention afterwards there was this uh, second phase of reporting for us um, after the first big splash sort of every EU institution, the management board, the European Parliament, um, all of the anti-fraud office, um, the European Ombudswoman started to investigate. And for this, uh, for us, this was um, this was luck and, and good because it, it proved as a starting point of further investigations. There were discussions inside those uh, closed circles which we will be able to have a look inside via more traditional journalism uh, sources and so on. But it posed also a challenge because every of our competitors, and I think some of them are in the line today, um, was, was able to report on this as well. Um, and uh, we couldn't let the story slip away from us. So uh, it set off a, a whole chain of reporting. First, some, some more smaller online articles about specific events and then another big investigation which revealed the true um, scope of the Olaf investigation among other things. And um, in, in, in this time, the agency itself was in turmoil and we realized um, that people started to speak up. So many people uh, that we spoke to didn't actually realize what what Nick was uh, was was um, just showing those uh, details about the pushbacks. Not everyone knew that in in Frontex. Obviously, uh, it was different nationalities, uh, different border guards from different nations. Um, but a lot of people started to speak up. So there was, for instance, this letter from a from an unknown anonymous whistleblower sent to various media. Um, and obviously, we were re really interested in that, and and uh, it was a starting point for for a longer chain of reporting that hasn't stopped since. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's so important to really get into this life cycle of these investigations and stitching together this chain of reporting. Because for those of us who are not journalists, including myself, um, sometimes it's a bit of a mystery how these investigations grow and continue. Uh, so last but not least, we have Katie Fallon, uh, who is going to tell us a little bit about her work and the island of Lesbos, which is crucial uh, to, to this work. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks, Petra. Um, so I sort of feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, I'm not a Nick and I'm not a Stefan, but um, and I'm sort of relatively new to uh, the world of Frontex, but I've spent a good uh, period of time on Lesbos, especially recently. And I mean, to put it, to put a lot of this into context, you know, um, in the, the Michelini, the main harbor uh, of Lesbos, you see a lot of these boats, if you're just walking about, getting a coffee, getting an ice cream, um, they're coming into the harbor, they're leaving um, and, so what this kind of investigation offered me was this chance to put all of that into a bigger context for me uh, and work with some others like Nick uh, and Stefan who were able to uh, like working collaboratively uh, 
be part of an investigation that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to kind of be do on my own, basically. Um, I mean, you know, as I said, I spent a ton of time on Lesbos and you start to, um, as we were hearing last summer, there was uh, ongoing reports of pushbacks um, in the sea. I mean, so like Lesbos is an external border. It's uh, a Greek island. It's really beautiful. It's also very complex. It's had uh, in recent years, obviously a ton, um, a lot of people coming. Um, maybe it's not a crisis as people make it out to be, um, but we started uh, to recognize that there were more things happening um, last summer as um, arrivals uh, seemed to really dip. And obviously that was potentially due to the pandemic, but there were also other things happening. And it was really frustrating initially as uh, sort of, I am I do write for The Guardian, but I do write for other places too. I'm freelance. I'm like in the first few years of my career and uh, it was frustrating at first not to be able to sort of report on it credibly because I needed all the skills that other people have, such as Nick at Bellingcat, who's able to really um, put all of these things that you're witnessing on the ground and you're hearing about into context. What I was able to do, um, a bit like Stefan, was speak to people and so put uh, some of the sort of human perspective on it. So it's not just the survivors of these pushbacks, um, that we spoke to, we also spoke to, you know, people uh, who are working for NGOs, uh, even, I mean, a lot of locals will not know what Frontex is, but quite a few will because they've been living on Lesbos all their life. They know what a Coast Guard boat looks like. They know what um, a Frontex boat looks like. And then uh, suddenly it happened that we found someone actually quite a few people who on the August 15th day, which I think was when the NATO boat was present, uh, there was all these people on the beach and it was a Greek holiday. So there was lots of people out and this happened in broad daylight. And then this photo came up that someone had taken, um, which was able to re, uh, credibly show that there was a NATO boat present uh, also at one of these pushbacks. Um, and, you know, also this local was able to sort of put that, put more of a sort of, uh, again, a human face on it too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was super important for me to be able to kind of do this in a group. Um, I, I just, I really wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise. And I wouldn't have been able to do it in uh, such, uh, a, well, yeah, a credible way, um, I suppose. But um yeah, I, I suppose also one of the important things was uh, the fact that like, I also learned a ton doing it too. Like the idea of open source was also a new thing for me and it's still something that I'm learning. But um, being part of this team was kind of opened my eyes a bit more to everything else. And uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, I feel like I, was a smaller part of this uh, reporting team, um, but it's um, the on the ground perspective is, yeah, it, you just see everything. Like I was just seeing Nick do that whole presentation and it suddenly makes sense to me because I know where that part is on the Northern coast of Lesbos, but I would never been able to sort of map that out so credibly. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that's basically my, my part in this uh, very much bigger picture of Frontex, but um, yeah, it was nice to see some uh, accountability start happening from these boats that I've seen leaving the harbour a couple of times a week every uh, in Lesbos and see how this story started to play out, which, and it seems to continue to play out now too. Uh, thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate uh, the local perspective, um, particularly we were actually on Lesbos together, not to insert myself into the story here, but we saw Frontex boat park there just a few days ago. Um, so this really is the real world uh, happenings um, in, in this day and age. Um, now we are going to open this up to Q&A for the rest of you who joined us. But while you're getting your questions ready, um, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and lob one at our wonderful panel. Um, where do we go from here? How do we face politicians who publicly refuse to acknowledge the existence of these pushbacks? 
which literally happened to us on Monday. Um, we were at a press conference on Lesbos with the EU commissioner and the Greek immigration minister. And, you know, he went as far as to say that the reports of pushbacks were fake news. What do we do about this? While everyone's being polite, I'm going to jump in and answer um, answer that, or try to. Um, look, the, the deck is very much stacked against journalists on this. Um, these these are activities which are which are taking place um, pretty much out of sight. I mean, even the open source work that Nick refers to, this is piecing together fragments um, of. Uh, of digital information, and then seeking as many different corroborating sources as you can. Um, the only reason that we were able to put this together to begin with is because we managed to concentrate academic knowledge and years worth of specialist reporting that gave us an understanding and a frame to put all of this into. Um, really good on the ground reporting, huge amount of energy from, um, from a range of different reporters at different stages of their career, and then a whole open source team from Lighthouse and from Bellingcat in order, and then a whole process of follow up where we've got political reporters um, and people with sources inside international institutions and a bunch of experts who understand how those institutions are meant to work. Now, if you describe that series of resources to most people who work in media at the moment, um, they have a big smile on their face because this is not normally the kind of team that goes into, into breaking a story like this. And these, these resources are very rarely brought together to work in concert. Um, so without, without um, kind of picking up Lighthouse in an absurd way, what we're trying to do is, um, is, is to borrow and convene resources from a lot of different, um, different places. And, and build those into teams that can sustain their interest in a topic like this. So where does this go next? Well, it's very clear that without this reporting, what would have happened next is that there would be ongoing deniability. And under the cover of that deniability, there would be some attempts to tweak the different mandates and regulations that govern how um, these agencies and these actors are allowed to, um, to act. And essentially, you would have a semi-formally acknowledged pushback system, which exists in enough of a gray zone that it can just keep on going. That was what was pretty much meant to happen. Um, and then some people came along and got and built a coalition um, and created some accountability around this and had made this whole exercise in um, saying one thing but doing another at Europe's borders a bit trickier than it would otherwise have been. I mean, it's still gonna be an enormous battle to maintain coverage and maintain interest and to prove various different incidents. It's a constant challenge. Um, I would say that even huge, even the Leviathans, the big media beasts like the New York Times have, have struggled to, um, to land big complex investigations around this. It's, it's very challenging work and it, it really can't just be done by one outlet or one reporter. And then in terms of building an audience and creating a constituency for more progressive European politicians who can hold their own institutions to account, that doesn't work unless there are Germans that care about this, unless there are French people that are reading about it, unless there's people in the UK who are picking this up as a story. So the reporting has got to We've got to build reporting teams, um, and the work from from the from this reporting has got to reach audiences in multiple places um, in order to create some kind of constituency for this. Um, I mean, the entertaining thing I think with this one, as Stefan has alluded to, is that the the fallout from this has been it is now sufficiently complicated that there are quite a few people who are experts on this call. Um, some of you may know of the of the work of Matthias Monroy. Um, who was uh, tweeting out a couple of days ago that, it, that he was beginning to get confused with a number of different investigations going on into Frontex. And if, uh, if Matthias is, is confused, so are we all. And it's a good indication that there's a lot of different mechanisms that grind into place. Um, in some senses, it's an optimistic story because it does show that if you can put credible evidence out there, there are people who will pick it up and make noise about it. And there will, um, 
be some form of consequences. Um, so that's to some extent encouraging. I don't know what others think. Let, let me pick this up because uh, I think one of our biggest um, challenges and, and what we finally uh, reached to, to do is uh, create this European public space, not as a whole, of course, but around one issue. So if you look at the debate in the newly founded Frontex Scrutiny Group, um, you, you realize that um, major national media of important member states of the European Union have, um, have actually reported. There's this um, European-wide discussion ongoing. So we, so we reached that kind of level. And I think it was extremely difficult um, to do so. And it took, as you said, this, this international European-wide reporting team that you have different stories and, and different uh, European media to do so. Um, that, that is one of the things that I'm most proud of, actually, that, that we have this European-wide debate. Um, it was not happening before. Um, even, even after the first few weeks of the, of the investigations, you could see that uh, members of the European Parliament would be struggling to keep up um, with the level of knowledge that was, that was revealed. Um, there was this internal discussion on the management board, but that was um, sort of secretive. So um, it's it's a good example of how of how much energy you need to put those kind of things in the spotlight, and we finally reached it after many months, I believe, with this uh, new Frontex scrutiny group. And then, what is the result of this? Uh, is the Greek side prevailing uh, prevailing and calling all of this fake news or not? We will see. Not my job to determine this, but I think now everyone has a fair chance of of uh, making their point. And now it's largely a political discussion and, and about political will. There was one question in the chat uh, that I felt like I would like to take from by Jeff Crisp, wondering if there are any whistleblowers within the Frontex administration or others, other military forces associated with it. Um, yeah, so I tried to say this in a, in a, in a way without revealing too much. Um, what I can officially probably say is this: there's, there was this email by a self-called or by, by a person that himself called himself a whistleblower, I believe. It went to different media, so that's not a secret. Some media just put it out uh, as, as, uh, as facts by a whistleblower. And we spoke to more people and what we wrote in the, in the, in the pieces, I believe, is half a, dozen, half a dozen sources inside and outside Frontex. I don't know if you want to call them whistleblower, but that's what we wrote. And uh, of course, I cannot tell more, but um, there was this feeling of term oil inside Frontex and people started to speak up. Um, so that was very important uh, for us and it's still important for us. If anyone's listening, feel free to contact us. Always working. <laughs> Thanks for tackling that question as well. Um, there's an excellent question about advice for journalists to cover Frontex, but perhaps we'll leave that one till the end and just try and get through some of the more substantive ones first. I'm also quickly realizing how little time we have. So we'll try and uh, get to as many of these as possible, but I realize that it might um, we might run out of time. Uh, we have a question about um, technology at the border um, and you know what else have you been seeing that Frontex is using and where this all might be heading? I think that's probably a good question for for Nick, as the as the former military man among us. Um, and another way to cast the same question, Nick, is how credible is it that you can't see and hear everything going on when you have thermal cameras and drones? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the kind of capabilities that, that Frontex has, it is is quite impressive. I mean, uh, the kind of vessels that they have uh, are fitted with ISR cameras, you know, with crazy ranges um you know they have th people with uh like thermal sites sat on top of mountains in lesbos watching watching the passes um or watching watching the seas rather um like in terms of what they're actually seeing it is quite difficult to tell uh you can't really tell without seeing like their uh like isr matrix or like exactly what they're watching and when um but they have a huge amount of surveillance uh, equipment there and you know, part of their mission is to try and establish what is happening uh, and, you know, preventing, so for example, trafficking and so on. I think it's even in their mission statement, actually. Um, 
and so part of the investigation was actually kind of saying hey look you've got frontex vessels within a couple of kilometers of pushbacks taking place so you know you have a rubber dinghy which you might not be able to see um but if you're two kilometers away with an isr camera that's four meters or three or four meters above the cell of the sea you certainly will or you certainly could see it um it is interesting for me especially as a kind of military background to see the level of militarization along the border um and this isn't just the case with the aegean where you're seeing all these kind of assets being deployed um on both the greek and, and turkish side as well so you're seeing the kind of uh turkish drones as well cutting along the aegean uh border too um but also along the land border uh kind of around everos um where although it's you know the border is already kind of militarized already in the period after kind of february we you know saw like berms being put up, like uh, Hesco Bastion um, being put up. You know, it, was, it looked like two, uh, or certainly, certainly from the Greek side, of them, you know, for understandable reasons, you know, they, they thought they were going to war. Um, so it, it's been quite interesting for me because as someone who doesn't have that kind of experience with this area, either with, really within the Aegean or Everos, to, uh, certainly before, you know, kind of like around 2019, to see that this kind of militarized border uh, existed there. And to the extent that uh, it's been or continued to be militarized with all these ISR assets, um, you know, with the kind of physical force assets that we saw being deployed in, in Evros around kind of February and March. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how much that answers your question. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there to the point where it actually surprised me to like the kind of capabilities they had in this, this region. Thanks so much, Nick. That's super useful. And again, not to artificially insert myself into the discussion, but I'm someone who's trying to understand how this technology plays out as well. And just on Friday, um, Frontex put out a press release um, really showing its obsession with new, sexy, shiny tools like artificial intelligence, whatever that means. There's now a whole new report um, for you to check out. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, nobody really knows what exactly this will entail, but the, the obsession and this kind of turn to techno solutionism is, is certainly there. Um, do check out the chat. There's some really fantastic uh, resources being shared. Um, but I'm going to, uh, with the remaining few minutes that we have, because I know some of us have to leave right on the hour, I would like to turn to each of our panelists in turn um, and ask the question, that uh, was posed uh, regarding how difficult it actually is to cover Frontex for journalists, because I know there's some students and some junior journalists uh, listening in on the call as well, um, particularly given the fact that many people are working remotely and it's such a complicated area to cover. Um, so if, if each of you could perhaps give us some, some thoughts and, and share some ideas, that would be fantastic. Um. Katie, do you want to do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I suppose in brief, I would say contact Lighthouse, not to sound like um, some sort of uh, PR, but it, it's true. Without um, meeting everyone here, I I wouldn't have been able to do this. I suppose a longer answer would be work collaboratively. Um, and don't be afraid if you don't have the skills to do some things, because as I was saying, it's like what was great about this was working in this sort of patchwork format and that I could speak to people on the ground. I could put some of the more like, as I was saying, human elements in context, but I just couldn't do some of the other open source things. I didn't have the contacts that other people had. So, I mean, working collaboratively was the only way I was ever going to be able to report on this story. So reach out to people who are also working on these issues, researchers, open source people um, would be would probably be my big biggest tip um, to anyone wanting to investigate people like Frontex, um, which obviously seems like this big lofty institution. But as we've realized, when you kind of do work together and put all these little bits together, you can uh, create a credible uh, account of how what happens uh, in, for example, the EU's border agency. I mean, uh, I can go next. It's relatively short. My experience with this has been uh, like certainly is nowhere near the same kind of capacity as Daniel. Um, and like for that reason why I think it's 
uh, it's really important to form the kind of partnership so you can have a look at all kinds of data that's available. Um, from my perspective, coming into this relatively cold, being able to speak to people who actually fully understood the, understood the dynamics in the region uh, was incredibly useful. And being able to work with outstanding journalists like Stefan uh, as well meant that you could combine the open source uh, data with that kind of traditional reporting and the ability to report from the ground, like uh, with Katie, um, for example. Um, you know, or if when you take those kind of information flows and put them all together, you can actually produce something that is far greater than some of its parts. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can probably, I'll happily take this opportunity to, to thank everyone I worked with because it wouldn't have been possible, uh, or this simply wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't worked uh, as a team together, uh, you know, through kind of like the darkest days of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone who was on the school who helped with this investigation. It was fantastic working with you. Yeah, I can I can echo that, and um, I I think so. If you if you look at what happened when we started reporting about the Greek pushbacks back in May or something, it, it was actually. I'm, sometimes I'm confused which organizations are involved um, because it, it changed slightly with each investigation. A new member was added to the group. New journalists were added to the group. Um, and that worked really well because over the last couple of months we had this increasingly huge group of, of journalists with their own contacts and um, on, only this is why we, we have been able to, to cover a story as complex as this one but an agency as secretive as this one. Um, and, and I'd like to add it was a lot of fun actually. So it was, it was in the middle of a pandemic um, uh, where usually as a journalist in a, in a traditional news organization, you have those kind of conferences, daily conferences with your colleagues. Um, but we have been able to, to really work on issues um, until uh, from, from the morning until night and, and have um, reporting calls on it and, and, and work on it virtually. So that was a lot of fun. Um. Just to, to go to the core of, um, of the question, the starting point always has to be skeptical. Big institution is telling you one thing about what it's doing. Um, your starting point has to be um, has to be skeptical. You need to try to understand a little bit the evolution of, of, of that institution, what it's doing. Why is it telling you the story about itself that it is? And then you need to, to look through some of the critiques. There will always be, I mean, it might be quite academic. It might involve learning a new jargon or terminology. Um, but usually behind the sudden explosive growth of any new institution um, or the expansive take up of new technologies, there's, there is a narrative which, um, which that institution will be pushing. Be skeptical about that narrative. Um, take the time to understand the different critiques and things that you have on that. Um, and that should be your starting point. And then you are going to be able to, I mean, there are, we've mentioned some of the open source tools that you have today, but the transparent, the European Union is quite a contradictory space. Um, there is funding out there from the European Union to support exactly the kind of work that we've just been describing that did all of this in the first place. There is a transparent tendering system that's out there that can give you huge amounts of information. Um, there are public databases. There are ways um, to go behind the beyond the press releases and to interrogate what you're being told um, and familiarize yourselves with these and and do that can be a starting point for, for tackling much bigger and more ambitious stories. Um, because Lighthouse is fundamentally, you know, what we do is try to take on big complex topics and build ad hoc teams from existing reporters, blend together freelancers and people from totally different skill sets. Um, there are lawyers on this call who we consult with and talk to who inform how we think about um, evidence. Um, there are academics and others here who've written PhDs and have done most of the hard walking um, in a journey towards understanding how an institution evolves, what purpose it fulfills and what might be unique or interesting about it. Um, 
I mean, Frontex at the moment is in the process of being becoming the first ever uniformed European force that will be bearing arms around the European Union. This is something unprecedented. Um, so there is something that's really interesting here, even when often you're being presented, institutions will often defend themselves from scrutiny by being incredibly boring um, in their public communications. That's very often the case. Um, tedium is one of the best, is one of the primary weapons in the European Union institutional arsenal. Um, if, if you want to go to a Brussels briefing in order just to double check on the truth of what I say. Um, yeah, so I think that that kind of that skepticism, understanding, and then try to figure out a way that you can, you can potentially team up and work with others um, in order to penetrate this. For those of you who don't know very much um, uh, about Lighthouse, we organize newsrooms, which are basically virtual gathering points um, for teams of people who are going to interrogate more complex topics. Um, LighthouseReports.nl is um, the website. Please take a look around there. We document the, the investigations that we work on, but we're not in ourselves a publishing platform. So the stories that we've heard about today appeared in Spiegel, they were on Bellingcat, they were in The Guardian and in a lot of other places. Um, so we're not a publishing platform and that's also why we're in a good position to, um, to run these collaborations because we're not favoring the way our own approach to the story. Um, we're in a good position to broker this for others. Um, and my daughter is somewhere in the background and about to put her point about all of this. So I think I'm going to shift to mute and let somebody else pick up from here. Great. Thanks so much, Daniel. And thanks to all of you also for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I mean, we could have this conversation for, for many more hours, um, but it's really, I think for me at least, highlighting the importance of interdisciplinary work when it comes to trying to understand these really complex issues. Um, again, I would urge you to take a look at the chat and also at Daniel's daughter who has joined our call. <laughs> She's also becoming an expert on Frontex. Um, please uh, do keep in touch with, with all of us. Um, I, I think the official event will wrap up at the hour. Uh, I'm not sure if some of the panelists would be willing to stay behind for a little bit and answer some of the other more substantive questions. Um, but unfortunately, these you know conversations are going to be continuing and for many years to come. So I'm sure we'll have additional events like this. I'm also going to repost all the Twitter handles of all our fantastic panelists. Please follow their work. Um, I learned so much from them every day and uh, it was really a joy to moderate uh, the panel for you all today. Thanks. That's great. And thanks to Petra and to the people.